Uh, good afternoon, Professor. Uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Uh, how long have you been in critical care and research? I'm by training an anesthesiologist. In Scandinavia, we have a dual speciality, so you become a specialist of anesthesia and intensive care medicine. So I practiced that for some 40 years. And uh, to start with, I, I did a lot of anesthesia. Later on, it was more intensive care medicine. I also had a career in, in, in being an ICU director and a departmental director for some years. And, but for the last 15, 17 years, I've been a professor, but I've been a clinical professor, clinically active during that time in the intensive care unit. <laughs> Research-wise, I, I didn't start my research until I basically become a specialist in, uh, so I passed my PhD in 1985 and been uh, academically active for the last than 30 years, basically, having some 300 plus publications and been supervising some 15 PhD students. Uh, with regards to uh, indirect calorimetry specifically, you are part of uh, quite a prolific study group in, in this field. Can you tell us a bit more about it? No, I mean, the research field is basically ICU metabolism in a broad sense. And my, for example, my, my dissertation was about muscle protein synthesis. Uh, but as you know, m there, is a muscle, uh, there is a skeletal muscle depletion in the intensive care unit in our patients. Studies you do with metabolism, nutrition becomes a part of that. And then we come to indirect kilometry because if nutrition is a part, the nutrition uh, protocol must be up, must be of good standard, and then indirect kilometry is needed. So I came to indirect kilometry out of a need to have a proper assessment of how to most adequately feed the patients that we did various studies on. In uh, practice today. How do you think indirect calorimetry compares against current practice of using equations? If current practice is to use equations, I think that is a dead end, basically. I, I, I think that these, uh, on average, if you have large groups, cohorts of patients, on average, uh, various equations compares reasonably well with the actual energy expenditure. But the scatter around that average, that mean, is too large. So basically, you know, you know very little about the patient in front of you by just applying equations. So that is not a good idea. That is basically just on a group level that it works, not on an individual level. So you think this would tailor uh, nutrition and nutritional assessment even better? Yeah, even better. I, I mean, the equation doesn't tailor it at all, basically. It, it, uh, it, no, I, I, I can't see any idea about that. That is basically an escape because pe people don't want to take the trouble to have a proper assessment. Then, uh, with regards to possible outcomes that you think can be improved by indirect calorimetry, what do we know now in what do you think is the direction uh, where we're headed in terms of outcomes? I, I think basically having a device where you can measure something like in kilometry will not in itself improve outcome. I mean, if you, if, you, if you have a feeling you randomize patients, half your patients have indirect kilometry, that is not a good idea. Indirect kilometry is a tool by which your nutrition therapy may be improved. And, and I mean, it, it comes down to the nutrition therapy, the, the um, protocol you have for nutrition therapy or how you manage that protocol, that will interfere with outcome. But the indirect kilometry or any other uh, measure will not in itself improve anything, but it gives you a sufficient tool to improve and, and to have a better outcome. But it, it, it's, it's not by itself a solution. It can be compared to the Swan-Gans catheter, for example, to measure central circulation. It has been multiple studies showing that just by putting in Swan-Gans catheters, nothing is improved. But if you make use of the measures that it gives, then it may be improved. Uh, now, Europe and the West have been using indirect calorimetry much longer than we have in, in our region in Southeast Asia. 
do you have any advice how to improve adoption, how to improve education and professional development in, in this area? You're very polite saying that Europe is in advance. I wouldn't agree to that. Some centers in Europe and some centers in North America apply in direct kilometry, but the majority of centers do not. And ba so basically they, they are still in the darkness in this particular field. Um, the idea of, of using it is that uh, most devices that are on the market today are good enough for a proper measurement and they will come to these measurements quite soon. And there is data that the variability over the day is not very large. So patient would be on a certain level which may change over time but not over the day. And so the measurement can be quite short and just as you find the readings stable you can be satisfied at that time point. So in a unit you do, don't need a device for each patient. You need a number of devices related to the number of beds that, that is and, and from that means that you can have a number of super users in your unit who, who basically get trained into this. It's not complicated but everybody has a learning curve and it's better that a few individuals has this learning curve and helps the others because they can hook up the, the indirect kilometer and, and then they can have a reading after a while. So it basically it's not needed for every nurse and every doctor to have it. But if they should apply in the reclometry, my strong recommendation would be to have what I call super users who, who have passed the learning curve and are technically good at handling this. Though it's not complicated, I think that is to be recommended. Uh, currently, one their their recommendations that say that for any patient staying in an ICU more than four days, that indirect calorimetry is essential in that the equations uh, do not accurately predict nutritional assessment. But are there any specific groups that you think are particularly high risk and we would tend to use indirect calorie calorimetry more towards these populations? Or are there any special groups? No, not really. I mean, you are, firstly, you are, you are limited to those on mechanical ventilation because otherwise uh, to, to use other type of, of devices connect to patients like masks, mouthpiece and so on are not very effective in the ICU and in particular as most patients has an elevated fraction of oxygen in, in the inspired air. I wouldn't say that there are any, any particular diagnosis, but I would say that, that uh, patients where it's extremely difficult to predict are the small ones and the big ones. Mm -hmm. the, very, the ones with low BMIs and high, high BMIs, if you want. There, the, the equations go totally wrong. And s still, I wouldn't, wouldn't refer to the equations because I think the equations is a problem in themselves because it gives a certain... Uh, safety, which isn't there, mm -hmm. and 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 it, 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 I, I would more emphasize that the lightweight one and the heavy ones are are the ones where you can go mostly wrong. On the other hand, you could say that any very fra fragile, fra uh, fragile patient, any patient with very narrow margins of physical reserve or whatever, is a candidate in the sense that. Small errors, small overdose of nutrition, for example, may be, may be deleterious for such a patient, yeah. Do you think it would have an impact on ventilator management? Do you see improvements in terms, in, in your practice, in your day-to-day? -day? No, not in ventilator management, not really, not so, really. Uh, faster weaning? No, the other things are much more important for faster weaning, I would say, no. Can you tell us a bit of uh, your experience with uh, the GE module in particular, the GE in direct calorimetry? Well, it's a, it's a breath to breath device. Uh, the traditional uh, indirect calorimeter, the Delta Track, which is still considered to be a gold standard, although the gas analysis technique is obsolete, so it's no longer on the market. But the Delta Track has a mixing chamber, which is a very good thing when you do indirect kilometry in ICU. Most other devices are developed for other reasons. 
Uh, some are, de are developed in work physiology, where a breath-to-breath -breath analysis is a good thing. The GE device was originally developed, uh, if I'm correctly informed, for, for end-tidal PCO2s in, 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 in anesthesia, uh, where breath-to-breath -breath analysis is a good idea. In the ICU, that becomes a limitation, because if you have are very tachypnoic, for example, or have small tidal volumes, uh, this technique becomes more hazardous, or uh, the readings becomes le less uh, less reliable in that. So that is a limitation. So uh, a mixing chamber would be be a good thing. But if we compare uh, the technique of of the the Covix device, I would say that it it it's well on the standard of any other competitor with that technique used. So, so we have made a comparison between others and, and it compares well and compared with the Delta Tract, it also has good quality readings. Do you see any other fertile areas of research for indirect calorimetry? For, for research, I mean, you, you, I, I think it's important for people in various parts of the world, in the units with various case mix, to use it, to, to, to bas ba basically have a better idea about how their patient population, how their cohort of patients uh, have energy expenditure, because that gives an experience uh, and it's difficult to give guidelines that will be applicable of all. I mean, at the end of the day, ICU patients, the only they have in common is that they are, are, are taken care of in the ICU. Uh, they are uh, very different diagnosis and so on. And therefore, to give guidelines just for critically ill patients as, as, as a group uh, very often lead to much too rigid guidelines that are not in the best interest of patients. I mean, the, the, the high density of staffing, nurses, doctors, should be a way to individualize treatment and their indirect kilometry is a very good uh, thing, yeah. Does this mean you encourage customization of protocols with regards to maybe a national protocol or hospital per hospital, depending on the resources yeah. they have? Yeah, of course, and, and, and the case mix, which comes with it. Because at the end of the day, that will perhaps be a young resident and, and a newly employed nurse who do the prescription for patient for a daily basis. So there must be a protocol. But for, for the unit, there should be a rather robust guideline. And, and if, if you have indirect kilometry, then you have a true measure of the energy expenditure, which is a great help in this, yes. How do you see the standard of care evolving with regards to indirect calorimetry? Well, uh, as you said in the introduction, I'm part of a working group in Europe and we try to advise manufacturers of, of, of these devices to make them more user-friendly, mm -hmm. uh, cheaper if possible. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, because then uh, there should, at the end of the day, be no excuses. And I think the individualized treatment and measurements of physiology and the knowledge of staff to apply uh, that these measures of physiology in, 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 together with their knowledge of physiology should give a better individualized care and a better outcome. That, that is, uh, as far as I see the future, you cannot basically uh, uh, Take, take away the skill of the staff, nurses and doctors, uh, their, their skill to read the instrument's readings, so to say, mm -hmm. is the clue. You, you, cannot, you, you cannot replace high professional level of staffing by instrument, but you can give them good instrument mm -hmm. to make the best use of their knowledges. So that's how I see the future. Uh, thank you very much, thank Professor. You. Thank you.